This is last year's, and this is the honey I just harvested uh, three weeks ago. And look at the difference in color. Now, if you're like me, I prefer the darker honeys. And um, the thing about our region is there's no big agriculture anywhere where I live. It's kind of rural and it's building up because I guess everybody wants to live in this area. And uh, the sad thing is they're cutting down lots of trees everywhere, which is a big source of food for bees. Uh, you know, there's these neighborhoods that are going up with literally 2,500 homes in them. So some, some of the old timers in the area are selling out and uh, they're cashing in, you know, becoming overnight millionaires selling their acreage. But I, um, I hate to see that happen. We're on a, on a 30 acre property here and we're right next to a 300 acre property that's owned by the city and it's not going to be developed. So I'm in kind of a sweet spot, kind of like a little oasis away from all that sprawl. But I just wanted to tell you that whatever's in the area that the bees harvest, I, I never know what they're gonna get, but it's not based on any kind of big uh, monoculture crop. It's just whatever the bees forage that year. And my bees are not migratory. They're always in the same spot year after year. All I do is I open them up, harvest the honey, I spin it all. I don't um, separate it, you know, one month from another or one hive from another. It all goes into one big bucket or two, and this is what I get. So for me, the darker the honey, the better. I like my honey like motor oil dark. And um, there is a honey that is very popular here in Northeast Georgia. That's my drink. There's a popular honey that's called sourwood. And I'm not a honey connoisseur by any means, but the sourwood honey is definitely my favorite. It's got a very nice caramely flavor and it goes really good in coffee and so does this dark honey. Another one that's dark is buckwheat. I think that's a very dark looking honey. And, but, but again, this is only what the bees are foraging in the area and it's mostly a forest based honey. So whatever trees they're uh, foraging from, we don't have open fields of, you know, acres and acres, except for the power line trails. Those are the only acres of uh, uh, fields, if you will, that have all kinds of wildflowers and uh, raspberries and blackberries and stuff like that. So they do harvest a lot from those as well. But I just love seeing the different years, the different colors that you get from the honeys. And again, my favorite is the dark honey. Okay, let's go in the backyard. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Hey, it's okay. Hey, come here. All right. Hi. Hi. I, I see you. I do. I see you. Yes, I do. I see you. He's okay. He's okay. It's all right. They're still getting used to each other. They're not overly taken with the dog just yet, but this is pretty good for them. I couldn't even have them in the backyard together for a while. Right? You were having a fit. Yeah, you had a fit. You had a major fit. These are the backyard bees. And um, they are doing really well. And this one here is probably about to swarm. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to stop right here so they don't get ruffles too close to them. Ruffles, stay here, buddy. So that one is um, really bearding, I guess, because, again, there's a lot of brood that's hatched. And they're having a lot of trouble getting in through that hive beetle baffle. It's the round entrance hive beetle baffle, but it's the only thing I can do to keep them hive beetles out. Now, if you slide over one, this hive and this hive are both using hive beetle entrances, the baffled entrance from Guardian, but they're the slotted types and they're a lot easier for the bees to get in and out. So the slotted type work a lot better. The bees can get in and out no problem. Uh, the round 
Not so good. There, this is what happens with the round. So if I took that off, there'd be far less bees. But what I probably ought to do is bring a larger hive over and put them into the larger hive. Now here's my plum tree and the bees are working that. And let's come around here, some of these hives. Now I'm going to show you the ones that won the contest for the most honey. So this hive is empty. It's just uh, spare boxes right now. This hive... Whoops. This hive was the winner. Whoops, I'm trying to get... This hive was the winner. This had the most honey. And this hive right here used to be my weakest colony. Now it's one of my strongest. I'm already late in hanging my swarm traps because I've got my tulip bush already bloomed out really good. And um, I got a bee that went up my pant leg just now. <laughs> I was wondering what was going on. He hasn't made it too far yet. Uh, I can still keep my composure, but if he gets past my knee, this video is done. Oh, you gotta get out of there, buddy. I don't know if I can get him out of there. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know how he got up there. Anyway, you never know what's gonna happen in the bee yard. So here's one of my Bradford pears. And um, if you know anything about Bradford pears, it's kind of a very soft wood. This particular one, we had a bad windstorm come through. In fact, I think it might've been an F1 tornado. It just kind of cut through this area here. I've got some other trees that fell down all in this line. The Bradford pear was in that direct path too of that small tornado broke the thing off almost at the base here and it's uh it's growing back so i hate the thought of cutting it down especially when the bees um, are probably going to enjoy and they're all up in here i see them now i don't think this thing smells that good though the bees like it but i don't think it smells that nice so let's go for a walk down here i've got another trap that i usually catch bees in down here and in fact, this one does a little better than the one that I was just at. If I'm gonna catch bees in the spring, it's usually this one or the one behind my shop on my barrel. They love the barrel. Let's see if I got it in, in you here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, nobody's here. There's no interest right now in this particular swarm trap. Nobody's, uh, nobody's looking at this one yet. And you know, sometimes that's discouraging, especially if it's one of your first years in beekeeping and you start putting swarm traps up and you're not seeing anything. That can be a little discouraging. So just remember the 50-50 rule. If you put up 10 swarm traps, you'll probably catch five. It's about 50-50. Now, last year was highly irregular. It was very favorable. Uh, I caught, I, th I think I caught a swarm in every trap I hung last year. That's never happened. I don't know if it'll ever happen again, but it sure was fun. Yeah, they're, they're doing good. They're bringing pollen in. And I think I did harvest just a little bit of honey from them. They have not been a big producer, but they're not a they're not a sickly hive or anything like that. They just don't produce tons of honey. Let me just see if I can zoom in for you. But I just like having them. It doesn't matter to me. If they produce honey, that's great. If they don't, I don't care. I just like having them. There they go. See, that's, that's another one of those guardian entrance uh, baffles for hive beetles. These work the best, these slotted style, the slotted style that you see, they work the best. And I've, this hive has been here, I think three years now. I think this is its third, could be its fourth. Now, if you look, I've only got the one entrance open. And it's been that way since day one. 
I just never open up the um, far entrance. I have aluminum window screen with a Swiffer wipe over it. I, I leave it that way year round. I, I don't even know why. It just, mainly it's because they never really build all the way out. This holds 21 frames and they never really build all the way out. They only go up to about 16 or 17 frames. And then I'll get the honey that's on the outside, which might only be, I think this year I got like a half a frame. It wasn't anything huge, but it was extra honey and I didn't have to feed them. So, you know, you have to count that as a win if you're not feeding your bees and you're still harvesting. This is one of my favorite spots on my whole property. It is, I don't know, it's surreal. Um, I have to pinch myself every time I come out here. Isn't that just beautiful? And you can just sit here and watch the bees come and go. Um, I put this hive here just because if I were a bee, I'd love to have this view every day if I could. So I put them here. They are doing just fine. Like I say, they're not a huge producer, but um, they've been here three going maybe on four years now and they're doing just fine. And they're a good stock to have in my apiary um, because they're survivor bees. They survive year after year and I don't have to do anything special with them. I don't treat them, I don't feed them, and I'm only in them once a year now, every February, and that's it. This one's Old Faithful too just kind of happened by accident. I had a swarm trap sitting out here just because I didn't put it away. And then the bees swarmed here and I've been catching them here on top of this barrel every year. So I just put one there now and I put a little dab of lemongrass oil on it and wait patiently. Now this particular swarm trap, I was actually able to get out early because I live here. So I was able to put it up early, but it's been up for about three weeks. I think I'd put them up around the same time I harvested my honey. No activity here yet, but uh, one of those backyard um, hives will probably throw a swarm and wind up in here. And just to make sure that my odds are really good, I like to put a little dab of lemongrass oil on them about every 10 days or after it rains. It can really wash it off. So all I do is I just take my bottle and dab a little here and you can put a little on your fingertip and I put some underneath that way in case it does rain I got a good chance that the stuff underneath will keep that fragrance of lemongrass oil going this really brings bees it's um, not as good as swarm commander that's one that works really well I've not used it personally but that one works really good. You can buy that at a bee supply store it's called swarm commander but lemongrass oil is really effective. I use the food grade or pharmaceutical grade lemongrass oil. Works great. You ready to go do the next one? He's watching his friend the kitty. That's his buddy. Those two are buddies, believe it or not. They play all day. He plays rough, but they like to play. So this is another Old Faithful tree. I catch them here almost every year. Um, there's only been, I think, once where I didn't catch uh, one of my swarms here. So I usually catch one in this one. So again, I'm just gonna reignite the excitement about this hive with a little dab of lemongrass oil. Right there, that's all you need. A dab will do ya. So how did February become my new favorite time to harvest honey and do my springtime inspection? Well, it just so happens because it works really well in my climate zone. So I don't recommend this if you live up in uh, the New England states. You're not going to get away with this there. But here we have a mild winter. We only have a few days where we get maybe in the teens, you know, uh, maybe like 15, 16 degrees, but it only lasts for a couple days. Averages maybe 45 during the day, 55 during the day, 30, 25 at night, and that's Fahrenheit. So in my climate zone, here's what I've noticed. I, and so for those of you who follow Dr. Leo, I just kind of want to pass this along to you. So if you follow Dr. Leo, um, he likes to harvest his honey in the fall, late fall, right around the time of the first frost. I think that's a great idea too. The only problem that 
I have with that is usually I'm in, I have a very weird work schedule. I don't work a normal nine to five job. My work is seasonal and when it happens, it's very intense and I can't break away. It, it's almost like impossible to even tie my shoes during those times, but I'm so busy. But then when I don't have that work, I can be out messing with bees or whatever. Uh, or Ruffles and I, we can go on little adventures together now. Um, so what wound up happening was I would harvest my honey as close as I could to that last or that first frost and I'd wait for a day where it'd be like 65 degrees and wouldn't you know it, I'd open up a hive and I'd have robbing like you would not believe. Um, I couldn't even walk around the bee yard. I'd, I'd have my uh, lawnmower with a wagon and I'd put the an empty hive body inside the wagon and I'd take my frames of honey and put them in there. I had bees following me everywhere because it was so nice outside and they were trying to rob the honey that was in the cart. So anyway, it kind of happened by accident. I was um, harvesting, uh, I wanted to harvest honey, never got to it. Finally, I had a nice warm day in February. Now this is going back probably about, oh, I've been doing this for probably about five years. And I tried doing it in the fall, even though I was doing it in February before. Anyway, I just said, you know what, uh, in February we get some really nice days. The bees start bringing pollen in right around January here in my climate zone. Um, so I opened them up and it was no big deal. The bees were calm. The really cool thing about harvesting in um, February for me was that the bees were calm on a nice day. You just go out on a real nice day. They were bringing in pollen. Their numbers hadn't built up yet. So you're dealing with the smallest possible colony size. You're at the beginning of a nectar flow. So there's no real bad competition for food. And so I had frame upon frame upon frame of honey sitting in my lawnmower wagon in my empty uh, boxes that I harvest from and they just sat there and nobody cared. The bees were as content as could be. They were just coming and going in and out of their own hives and I said you know what why am I fighting uphill? Uh, why don't I just go the easy route so that's what I'm doing from now on is I'm gonna harvest my honey every February and I'm also going to do my I do my spring maintenance so all I do is I just make sure that I have uh, I just make sure that I've got empty frames at, near the entrance of the hive and that's that's all I do and I harvest the extra honey. And here's one more thing um, that Dr. Leo also mentions is that let's say you are late getting to your colony uh, in the if you're one of those people that harvest in the, the fall right around the time of the first frost and let's say you don't make it you got a problem you can't make it winter sets in well now you can't open them up well you don't have to really worry too much because the frames of honey that are adjacent to the brood frames, now the brood frames is where they're going to cluster for the winter time, but the frames of honey that are adjacent to them, there's no bees that cluster on them, but they also act as a follower board. So you're really not hurting yourself by leaving your honey in over the winter time. Some people want to get it out of there just to get the volume uh, condensed, and if you're in a really cold climate, I guess I just recommend you stay on top of it and you don't let anything get in the way of it. But for me, my winters are way more forgiving and thank goodness for that because sometimes my schedule just doesn't permit me to get at my bees as often as I would like. But now I'm literally down to harvesting my honey and doing my spring inspection and I'm opening my hives once per year. Well, I need to stop this video just for one second. I know I'm trying to wrap things up but as I'm editing and listening to some of the things I'm telling you, I'm, I'm realizing that some of the stuff that I'm saying, like inspecting my hives once a year, how can that possibly be? Well, all I can say is now might be a good time to subscribe to the channel because I got other stuff I want to share with you as well.